Okay, so for part three of these notes, um, this is where we're going to delve into this whole idea of what they call the phase constant. Um, phase constant or phase shift, sometimes they refer to as well. Um, but this idea of the phase constant, and it's a really important idea for this first section, so feel free, obviously, to, to go through this a few times if you need to. Um, but I really want to lay out exactly where everything is coming from. So before we get into like the specifics of the phase constant, let's just come back to this equation on its own for a second, right? So we know that it's normally 2 pi f times t. That's kind of just our standard. But what I want you to realize is we've talked about already, omega is equal to 2 pi f on its own, right? Omega is just a conversion from the frequency. So when we look at this equation, we're really looking at x equals a times cosine of omega times t. And the reason that that's important, the reason that this whole equation works, is because omega times t is really just theta. If we think about this, assuming that it's rotating at a constant velocity, which is what we're looking at here, assuming that omega is constant, then omega would equal a change in theta over a change in time. If I rearrange that, then omega times t would simply be change in theta, right? So the reason that this function works, and I want to make sure we're all comfortable with this before we get into the new stuff, but the reason that this function works is because really all I'm doing is I'm saying the x position would be my amplitude times the cosine of that angle, which makes sense because if I just choose, so I'm going to choose like that bottom triangle there. So if I choose that bottom triangle, if the hypotenuse, which is the radius of the circle, is the amplitude, right? Because the amplitude would be the furthest away, which would be the radius of my circle there. So if the hypotenuse is the amplitude, then if I know whatever angle I'm at, I can find the x position because the x position would simply be x equals a times cosine of theta. So hopefully this makes sense with where the equation comes from, right? Really I'm just saying x is equal to the cosine leg of that triangle, right? And then I'm replacing theta with omega times t, and then I'm replacing omega with 2 pi f times t. Um, so this is just a breakdown of kind of where that equation comes from. It's not like we've created some new brand new expression for this. It's actually just our basic definition of trig, which we've known for years now, and it's, it's taking that and applying that with angular motion. So pause here if you need to for a minute, but I hope that this all makes sense because it's really important that this makes sense for then what we're about to do. So take a moment if you need to, um, but if you're good, so here's what we're about to do. So for our function, basically what we're trying to do, now they use a different symbol, I believe that's the Greek letter uh, phi or phi, I can't remember how it's pronounced, um, but they're using a different Greek letter, but it's still representing the angle. And so what they're saying for this is, okay, so what if it's not starting at, what if the unit circle here is not starting at zero, right? Normally when we just do our function, we start at zero and therefore the change in the angle would be the same as the angle that we're at, right? But what if we're not starting at zero? Well, again, if I were to just look at this function as, I'm gonna still use theta for a second, but again, we can switch that to that new symbol. It doesn't matter a whole lot which symbol we use. But if I were to do this, so instead of being zero, what if there was an initial angle then it would just be my final angle minus my initial angle divided by time. And sure enough, if I were to rearrange that to solve for my final angle, my final theta, my final phi, whatever you want to call it, um, would just be omega times t plus the initial angle. And this is kind of what our phase constant is then, right? This is saying that, well, instead of doing just theta, what if I'm doing my final theta? Because that's really what I want to know is where's my final angle at, right? So when I do this equation, I really want to know what's the overall result, right? What's my final angle that I'm at in order to be able to find that value? Well, instead of just plugging in the angle, we're going to plug in then this whole thing. Um, so we're going to end up, the, the variation on our equation here um, is we're going, to ver we're going to end up here with, and I'm just going to do this fresh and off to the side, um, but x equals, still going to be a, we're always going to use cosine, and this is going to allow us to stick with cosine rather than flipping back and forth between cosine and sine, but then I'm going to use omega times t plus 
this initial phase constant. Again, you can use a theta if you want to. They just use a different letter, I think, to kind of make it a little bit more generic. Um, but you can use theta if you'd like to as well. Uh, but anyway, so this is our expression. What I want you to notice again is this is still omega, so it's still just our traditional 2 pi f times t plus that phase constant. So really the only thing that changes on a lot of these questions is we have to figure out what the initial angle is going to be. Because if we can find the initial angle, this would represent basically my change in angle. So this would be my change in, in angle, this would be my initial, and then as a whole, the entire uh, period of that function, the entire inside of that function, I should say, would represent my final angle, which is really what I want to evaluate. So a lot of different stuff going on with the angles. Again, pause this, roll back through this if you need to. But the bottom line is, if we are not starting at the amplitude, the first thing we need to do on a lot of these on a lot of these questions is figure out what was the initial angle, what was my phase constant, what was my shift, in order to know exactly what function I can do. So this is the variation of this equation that we're going to look at. Now I'm going to give you a couple of simple examples, and then we'll look at a few that are more a little bit more involved here as well. So for an example, let's say I had a unit circle here, right? What if I was starting at, instead of the positive amplitude like I normally start at, what if I was starting here at the equilibrium position? Well, if I think about that, so this is hopefully pretty easy to see as a picture, right? If I'm looking there, the starting angle would be, rather than starting at an angle of zero on the unit circle, I'd be starting at an angle of pi over two. So my initial phase constant would simply be pi over two. So what that allows me to do is x equals a times cosine of, rather than just 2 pi f t, I would do 2 pi f t, but then plus pi over 2. Now those of you that are comfortable with your trig identities hopefully realize that cosine of 2 pi f t plus pi over 2 is actually equivalent, right, to sine of 2 pi f t, which is basically what we did last year. So it takes into account the shifting for us. So again, we're not going to have to mess with our sine functions. You could still choose to do that if you really wanted to. If you knew that it was starting at one of these uh, equilibrium positions, you could still do that. But the problem is if we just choose sine, we don't necessarily account for which way it's going. And that's the other piece of the puzzle that the phase constants can help us do. So in general, we're just going to use cosine, but we're going to have to think about on a lot of these examples, we're going to have to be thinking about what our phase constant should be. So the next picture here, I know at first it's a little bit overwhelming with this diagram, but this next picture does a good job of showing us exactly what's going on, right? So this, this first picture on the left shows us that instead of starting at our amplitude, this one's starting here up at the one half A, right? So that's actually very similar to that last example, example two that we just did. So we already know, based on that last example, that the first time it passed through um, that one half a was at the uh, trig value for pi over three, right? We've already found that for the cosine value. So that's what this is showing me is my initial phase constant would be pi over three, because if I'm starting at one half the amplitude, that could be either at pi over three, or again, we talked about in that last example, this could also be five pi over three, right? And then the next thing we have to consider is which way is the is the object which way is the particle moving um, so in this case the picture shows us that the particle is actually at pi over three but it's still moving back towards equilibrium it's still moving in the negative direction that's actually a very important piece of the puzzle for us because we're going to need to know both where is it we need to know where is it where's its location right where's its x but we also need to know which way is it moving for most of these positions. That's not very good grammar, but that's okay, right? So where is it and then which way is it moving? Because for each of these locations, it could be at the same position, but then moving opposite ways. So here it could be again, either moving to the left or to the right. If I told you that I had a block that was over here at one half A, if I told you that it was moving away from equilibrium, that actually would be this particle down here which would tell me then that my phase constant was 5 pi over 3 or negative pi over 3 instead of the positive pi over 3. So we actually have to pay attention to those two key features. Where is it 
and then which way is it moving. Um, so if I look at these pictures, these kind of show me a good just overall view of what's going on, right? So this shows me that the graph would instead be starting at half of the amplitude. Notice it still follows the same periodic motion. It still reaches negative A, still reaches positive A. It's just starting. It's shifted, right? So it's just starting in a different location. Um, the velocity, similarly, um, is doing the same type of thing. It's starting with a negative velocity because it's still moving to the left. It still reaches the same maximum values that it normally would, um, but because of the shift, it's starting at a different point along that process. Um, so anyway, a little bit tricky, a little, a little bit tricky, you might say. I know that's a good one, um, but it's it's difficult as we go through this. Let's look at an example or two real quick, um, and then I'll wrap up this this third and final video for today. So let's start with this this quick um, quick check example here. So the figure shows four oscillators at t equals zero which one has a phase constant of pi over 4? So the way that, again, we want to approach these questions is I want you to think about the unit circle first. And again, for those of us that aren't as comfortable with the unit circle, this is going to be a big chapter where we need to take some time and go back through that a little bit. But we know that pi over 4 would occur in the first quadrant, right? Pi over 4 happens right here. And so if, if normally I'm starting at the amplitude, we want to think about a couple things. So one, that tells me that the position should still be on the right side of the equilibrium position. So I know that the x value should still be positive because it's still to the right of our equilibrium position. However, this particle as we go around the unit circle would be going around counterclockwise, right? So this particle would be moving in the negative x direction. So we know two things now just based on that angle and that angle alone. We know that it's got a positive x value but we know that its velocity should be negative because it's going around the circle counterclockwise and moving in that negative direction. Um, so we've got that set up. Now hopefully choosing our answer shouldn't be too bad. So if I look at these options, right, A and B don't make any sense because their positions are incorrect, right? They shouldn't be to the left of the equilibrium position. So that doesn't balance out, right? So then I look at C and D because those are both on the correct side of the equilibrium. They're both to the right of the equilibrium position, which is here at zero. So then I just have to decide, okay, which one of those is it based on the velocity? C shows us that the block is moving towards the amplitude, which would be as if the block was down here and moving to the right. That's not what our object was doing, right? Instead, our object is moving back towards the negative amplitude, right? But it is at that positive position. So we can eliminate then and we can get down to option D. Um, like I said, a, a difficult one as we set this up here, um, but a very important one for us to look at. Okay, here's what I'm going to do because I don't want to run short on time on the next one. So I actually am going to skip example three for right now. We'll come back and we'll do that later. I do want to show you guys example four. However, I don't want to run out of time on this video, and since I'm limited to 15 minutes, so I'm going to do another video that's only going to be about two to three minutes. If you guys could please watch that one today as well. Um, like I said, it should still only be a total of about 40 minutes of videos, um, so you guys should still be good on that. But I'm going to stop this video here. If you would then watch that final video for example four.